here at Radio 3 DC, the G. Gordon Liddy Show. And uh, this is a fax in from uh, Frank Boykins. He's from Norfolk, Virginia. And he writes, uh, Mr. Liddy, why do you stutter so much? It is very uh, 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 annoying. Also, when you say, oh, my, you sound like an old lady. When you have a guest, you're always butting in, and you make it sound like you know more than your guest. When you disagree with anyone, why do you have to refer to them as fat, ugly, or whatever comes to your mind? That is a very childish thing for a man of your age to do. Uh, well, I don't know what, uh, what uh, show you're listening to, sir, <laughs> but I have never insulted anybody who called in with whom I disagreed by calling them fat or ugly or whatever else came to my mind. Then finally he says, why do people want your picture? Damned if I know, I'm fat and ugly. All right, let's see. <laughs> oh, God. Let's, go, let's go to the telephones. And uh, first up, from Connersville, Indiana, is Lisa. Lisa, you're on the G. Gordon Liddy Show. Good afternoon. Um, just got a comment to make. Well, okay. you, um, you had a comment to make. It's been a while back, and I haven't been able to get through to the show. Okay. And I really don't remember what was being discussed, but you made a comment to the effect of, as sure as there is no Santa Claus, we will be taxed or something of that nature, which may be true. I have no problem with that, except for the fact that twice a week I drive my son 45 minutes away from here to... Uh, speech therapy and he listens to the show also and at five years old I listen to you on two different stations one in the morning and one in the afternoon so the afternoon is tape delayed and so I made sure he wasn't listening that day on the way to speech well uh, you know I wonder perhaps if on that day my failure really was one of diction I recall specifically saying there's no such thing as a free lunch but I did not so far as I can recall, say that there's no such thing as Santa Claus. Because I know full well there's a Santa Claus, because come Christmas, I am he. Well, I did, well my five-year-old, I took it the wrong way then, and my five-year-old would have also. Yeah, well, and, uh, yeah, no, I, I really... I, very young listeners also. Uh, well, I, I understand that, and, and uh, for, for that reason, uh, uh, I have, have referred to the Easter Bunny several times. Uh, yeah, but I not am, that there I wasn't am. an Easter Bunny, but that there, you know, I talked about the Easter Bunny. But I can't recall, uh, you know, it's rather early in the season still to even be thinking in, in terms of Santa Claus. But I, I do remember... The flight's already out. Yeah, all right. All right. Well, usually... It irritates me, but it's out before Yeah, I know. Because I, I like to have them do it after Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Yes. But in any event, uh, I, I do recall approximately the time I think you're talking about uh, referring to there the being no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, but if, if I did make that slip, well, I apologize, because I certainly want all the children to believe in Santa Claus, because I've been getting a lot of credit for, uh, for Santa Claus in my own family for a lot of years. Well, my children definitely know the reason for Christmas, mm -hmm. and, but they also believe in Santa Claus, and I think as a child they need to. Well, they sure, so. they, they should, and, and, uh, and the Tooth Fairy, too. I, oh, yes, we've lost our first tooth here recently. Oh, boy. Look, what is the going rate these days? Uh, that one was a buck. A dollar I for a to tooth? Get, I used to get dimes and quarters. I used to give dimes, and, <laughs> uh, I mean, forget about a quarter. I mean, for, for I'd, I'd want your whole mouth for a quarter. <laughs> the going rate these days is a buck a tooth. Wow. So, we're... Oh. It's, it's getting a little expensive. Well, yeah, the tooth fairy's running out of money here. <laughs> yeah, real quickly. <laughs> yeah, Lisa. Oh, smoke. Oh, my. Okay, Lisa, but, thank you very much. But I just, I just, it was just been on my mind. And, well, that's perfectly all right. You know. That is a legit, that is certainly a legitimate request, and I will bear that in mind. And for okay. any, any of you five-year-olds listening, and I, I know that actually 90% of my audience is made up of five-year-olds. Uh, he's very astute. He does listen, and he, you may not think he's listening, but then all of a sudden he'll come up with a comment. And w what is his name? His name is Richard. Richard, there is a Santa Claus, and he is a wonderful, jolly old man, and the only difficulty he has is when he, uh, he gains a few pounds, he has difficulty getting down that chimney. <laughs> 
Well, we don't have a chimney, so we had to convince him that uh, Santa Claus has a master key to the house. Well, uh, why don't you... <laughs> all right. Uh, why, don't, why don't you tell him that he's, he's very thin and he comes through the, uh, the, the standpipe going through the bathroom? Oh, oh. but anyways... Okay, Lisa. It's a talking with you. It's a, it's a delight to talk to you. And uh, it's sounding as lovely as you are, I wish I had that master key. Thank you. Okay. You're on the G. Gordon Liddy Show. Hello. Hello, Gordon Liddy? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I've been interested for a long time in the uh, uh, what happens to the prisoners in uh, the... Uh, in our American jails. I've been waiting so long, I've gotten a little uh, tongue-tied here. <clears throat> but there was an article that I read yesterday in the, in the November issue of Reader's Digest, and it talks about, must our prisoners, prisons be resorts? And uh, knowing that you've got a little experience in that area, I wondered um, how much of a resort our prisons are, and are they being coddled? But according to this article in the, in the uh, Reader's Digest, we've got a real problem that we haven't got enough room for the prisoners, and we're spending an awful lot of money on amenities. Well, uh, I was in nine different prisons in this country. I was never in one uh, that I w would even remotely characterize as a resort. Now, uh, not having been in every prison, I can't say that there are none that way, but I have never really heard of one from the prisoners or in the prison system. I've read of so-called country club uh, uh, prisons and what have you, uh, and uh, I was uh, in one briefly that had been characterized uh, as that. I've spent four months in uh, the Allenwood uh, uh, Minimum Security Camp in Pennsylvania, but uh, it, it was a mess. It, the, uh, the, the place was a, a wash in mud. Um, the, uh, the, the people were living out in, in hallways because there wasn't enough room. Um, the, about the only amenities that I can recall that we're having, we did have uh, television sets, and there was a gym of sorts uh, where people could go and, and lift weights and uh, uh, shoot a few basketballs and things like that, but uh, that was it. Well, have things improved a great deal since uh, you happened to spend a couple of years? Uh... Well, not that I have heard of, except that, that I was told that uh, up there that they... Uh, got control of the mud problem by putting in sod, but uh, that you know I haven't been there in many years. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know of any that that I would characterize as a country club. Now I have read uh, in the public press some what I consider to be uh, misguided uh, uh, things, such as saying, "Well, it's a bad idea to uh, have." Uh, weightlifting uh, facilities available for the prisoners uh, because they make themselves strong. Well, it's true that, that uh, some of them uh, do make themselves quite strong. Uh, I was uh, amongst those who did, but I think that it is actually in the interests of uh, the, the people who operate the prisons and, and probably also into society to have some way for the prisoners to uh, let off steam, if you will. Uh, physical activity, uh, especially that which you do deliberately to the point of exhaustion, which is what you do when you're weightlifting, uh, it, it, it's much better than uh, having people uh, all charged up and nothing to do except start a riot. Well, is, uh, is sodomy a, a big deal in prisons? And uh, There's a lot of, think of, th there's a lot of, uh, of uh, sodomy in prisons. Uh, it, it, there is, it, it's mostly uh, consensual uh, as it is uh, in, the, uh, in the outside world. That is, of course, uh, homosexuality. Uh, there's also some non-consensual that constitutes homosexual rape, just as there is uh, non-consensual uh, heterosexual activity in, in free society, which constitutes rape. Um, I, I think that uh, it, it's probably overstated in the mind of the non-prison uh, public how much there is. But there's, there certainly is stuff there. Uh, there's, there's some uh, guys who are uh, uh, homosexual who uh, just act as prostitutes. Well, do you have a feeling that our prisons are being run by uh, hand-wringers and... Uh 
there's a statement in here. It says it, inmates are sent to prison as punishment, uh, as punishment, but not for punishment. But that might be a play on words, but that certainly speaks well, for, for our prison system. The, uh, there isn't a prison. I'm not talking about ca county jails now. No, okay? I understand that. I'm talking about... Well, I'm talking about real the, prisons where you go when you've got big time and things like that. They are all run by the prisoners. Every single one I was ever in, run by the prisoners. I was not in a real prison in which I could not have had anything that I could pay for. I could have any kind of booze. I could name the brand. I could have women... Uh, I could say whether I wanted a blonde, a redhead, a brunette. Um, uh, you know, if I wanted to, I could gamble. Uh, if, if I wanted drugs, so that they were available freely. Of course, you have to be able to pay for it. And if you don't pay for it, you will be killed. And similarly, if you contract to provide a service like that, and you are paid for it, and you fail to provide the service, you will be killed. But uh, those are known as in the prisons as hustles, and they were all run by uh, 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 by prisoners. Um, from the most benign, like the laundry business, uh, if you if you want to have your prison uniform always starched and pressed and neat and clean and everything, uh, there were uh, th that was available to you, but you had to be able to pay for it. It was all That's done like, by. It's, like it's you're easy. overly concerned that our prison systems and the society is going to hell in a handbasket. Well, it, it it already is because it's run by nitwits. I mean, remember, this could not be done without. The, uh, uh, well, the, the people who uh, ostensibly run it, the prison authorities, are simply corrupted by the prisoners. All, all these things that you can get are being brought in by guards who've been corrupted. It's just corrupt guards, and they're paid off. And since sometimes they are, they are uh, threatened, blackmailed, and terrorized. They're, they, you got to remember, prison guards are trash they're they're uh, they're not they're they're the they're, they're not law enforcement officers they could not be law enforcement officers or they would be uh they, they are prison guards because they can't do anything else they're stupid um uh, half of them are functionally illiterate uh, you know the, 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 you, you're you cannot really expect people like that uh to run anything uh, much less run it well mr lady i appreciate it you're welcome, sir. Thank you so much. You're welcome, sir. All right, we'll take a break for crass commercial messages. All right, we're going now to the telephones. And uh, first up, from uh, Parma, Ohio, is Scott. Scott, you're on the G. Gordon Liddy Show. Hello, Mr. Liddy. It's a real oh. pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, sir. I wanted to ask you, with all your experience there, what type of hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat training you might have had. Okay, I was... Uh, uh, trained in two um, different systems. The first one I was trained in was an eclectic system uh, that was used by the FBI um, back in the 1950s. Uh, it, it took a little from here, a little from here, and a little from the other place, and it was simply called uh, defensive tactics, which was rather a euphemism because some of it was quite <laughs> offensive. Mm -hmm. And it it, it, it is best described, I, I think, most accurately described, as using the uh, very hard parts of your human body against the vulnerable parts and vulnerable areas of other people's, people's human bodies. Mm -hmm. Now, that was the first one. Uh, then uh, I had uh, uh, the ex you know, extraordinary experience of... Uh, uh, being trained in the tiger style of the high tai chi uh, during a long stretch in prison in which I, I, I shared a, a time in that prison with a pure Mongolian who was uh, a, a true master. Uh, he was much older than I, but just absolutely remarkable uh, physical condition, even to this day is, and it's 20 years later now, and give you an idea of, uh, of what this man was like. We had a heavy bag hanging out in the yard. And, you know, boxers and other people you would use the heavy bag. And, uh, you know, they would punch it and uh, would-be martial artists would kick it and that sort of thing. And it would absorb the blows. And one day, uh, this person who was training me wanted to demonstrate to me a technique of a backhand blow. 
and he was wearing a, uh, it was the closest thing I guess you could come to a robe in prison. It was quite loose, clothing quite loose. And there were people standing around, and they, uh, they were rather leery of this fellow. He was a ferocious-looking guy, although he was not physically very big. He was, he was in tremendous shape. And uh, at any rate, he just stepped up to that uh, heavy bag on the platform, and he was just speaking to me. And all of a sudden, he moved. It was so fast you could, you could hardly see it. Uh, there was a, a ripping, tearing sound, and what that was was the sound uh, of the flutter, if you will, of the, the loose clothing on him as it uh, went through the air. And then he hit that bag with that backhand. It split open and spilled the sand out. And you should have seen the look on the faces of, of these other guys who were there. I mean, they were absolutely stunned. And when this guy walked away, everybody just backed up just totally backed up, and the sound was like a pistol shot. Guards came looking. They, they thought somebody fired a gun. Now, this fellow uh, taught me uh, his system, what, what, and it, it, the tiger style of high Tai Chi. Now, Tai Chi is, of course, best known as an exercise system. It's done slowly, uh, but uh, performed at that kind of speed, it is a uh, very deadly art. Uh, the high Tai Chi simply uh, refers to the initial guard position. It is a high uh, rather than regular guard position. That's where it takes its name from. A lot of hand blows, not much feet? Uh, no, no, there was, there's feet. This, this fellow uh, uh, could, could kick uh, just straight up in the air uh, over him. Uh, he was enormously flexible, but it, uh, there, I would say that it was more hand uh, than feet, but he but he had a, a full complement of uh, of kicks. Well, it seems these days it's hard to find a decent teacher because mostly you get stuff from the movies, and anybody goes out there and says, "Well, they're an instructor, and they're going to show you yeah. one thing or another." Well, see, uh, actually, uh, I don't use this fellow's name because. Uh, this was a, 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 a deal that I made with him. He wanted to know uh, how to use a handgun, the, you know, the, the fast draw and all of that sort of thing. And he knew that I could teach him that, that I was a master of that. Mm -hmm. And so he taught me things that uh, he, uh, what he told me, was not allowed to teach uh, an Occidental, a Westerner. And it was, it was wicked stuff. But he showed it to me. I showed him all my secrets. He showed me his. And then we practiced. And, of course, we had years to do it. Well, you had time on your hands, sir. That's right. I had a lot of time on my hands. Indeed, I did. Well, do you feel, in your opinion, that the uh, quality of martial arts has gotten better? Because there's a lot of debate going on, basically, especially if you read, like, Black Belt magazine or something like that about... Well, the the, uh, the best uh, the best stuff I have seen, um, like like this man's, um, is is the the kind or style, whatever you want to call it, that is used by the Navy SEALs, and what it is based on is an exact knowledge of how a human body will react if you hit or even touch it in a certain way. It is an involuntary reaction. That was the time I was trying to think of that. What's that? I, I, I was trying to think of what, the, what they call that. Yeah, it, it's it. an involuntary reaction. And you, 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 it, it will happen exactly the same way every time. Mm -hmm. And that, you, that way, you know, you can just destroy somebody. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the main thing that uh, he taught me is... It, don't pause to admire your handiwork. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you strike, there is the reaction, and then you counter-strike you know, based on that reaction and the rest of it. it don't say, gee, wow, that's great. Isn't that pretty? And then go re react. You know, it's got to be just lightning fast. But um, it, it is wicked stuff because uh, you, you are using an intimate knowledge of the 
uh, reactions of the human body. Mm -hmm. and, and they're always the same from, and, uh, and from, from person to person. You say also a lot, a lot of attitude and confidence has a lot to do with that as well? Yes. Uh, yes, it does. And uh, what, what you should have is sufficient attitude and sufficient confidence discipline. That, and discipline that you don't throw that stuff around. In the first place, we're talking about a, what we call a hard art here, not a soft art. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a situation uh, in which you can gently flip somebody over into a corner and he'll be shaken up but not hurt. Uh, this, you know, when you start with this stuff, uh, someone uh, could, can die or be permanently crippled. Mm -hmm. And so you're not warranted in using it because somebody who is a drunk uh, is, is, you know, using a bad mouth or something like that. You, you don't Control. permanently yeah, cripple people uh, as a result like that. Uh, it, it, you have to have sufficient strength, discipline, confidence, what have you, that in a situation where what you can do is not warranted, you get up and leave. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't have anything to prove. Oh, of course. Because I think I got lucky. I found a teacher, uh, Sensei, and this guy is a true master, not in the sense of his arts, but the way he relates with people. Mm -hmm. Because I've been to some places where they teach you, and you know, you got to do this, 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 or this. And if you make a mistake, they scream at you. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm doing something, and I make a mistake. No, no, no. Just keep continuing through it. He goes, "No, mm -hmm. learn." It's like there's like you, you can't really make a mistake. He goes, "You learn from everything you do, even your mistakes." Well, actually, your your uh, your mistakes are your best instructors. <laughs> uh, you 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 learn more from your mistakes than than from your successes, really. But the the uh, this is what you've just mentioned, this business of the relationship with the instructor, the sensei, the teacher. Um, that's very important. Uh, you can translate that. Just go into, let's say, learning to fly an airplane, I mean, the flight instructor. There are uh, uh, flight instructors who are perfectly competent, but whose personalities will not match with yours. And, you, you know, you won't get along with them. You, you won't uh, enjoy it. And you should... Just walk right away from someone like that and find someone uh, with whom you can get along uh, and whose personality uh, works for you and so forth. Because we're all different. Well, and that's, that's certainly true uh, in the martial arts, too. Well, the reason I call, because you have a lot of his traits and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, you know, it's, when you go into a classroom or dojo or whatever, and you see this guy, I mean, you're going out there to do your best because mm -hmm. you have such an amount of respect for this man. Yeah. It's not like you're going in there following the basic moves and stuff like this. I mean, it, 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 it makes you want to learn. And, I mean, you're just like, you can't do no wrong. It's, you're there to learn. Exactly. And it's, it's such an amazing... Uh, yeah. if, you, if you knew it all, if you could perform perfectly, you wouldn't be there, would you? That's true. There you are. I'll tell you, unfortunately, uh, I have to break for these crash commercial messages... But you, you know, I really appreciate your calling, and I really appreciate your bringing up a subject that I find of great interest, obviously. Well, it's been a great pleasure speaking to you, and it's been a, really made my day here today. Thank you, Scott. You've helped to make mine. I appreciate it. God bless you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the deadliest art of all, commercials. <laughs> <laughs> and from You're on the G. Gordon Liddy Show. Good morning, Mr. Liddy. Morning, Scott. Yes, uh, apparently I wasn't able to catch your show a couple days ago. But I was told through a listener that you were making some comments as to corrections officers. Yeah, I am not fond of corrections officers. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, well, the comments that I have here, now this is paraphrasing, mind you, because I did not hear the show. Mm -hmm. I heard you that you said that on guards, they're, they're guards because that's all they can do. That's all they do do. What else does, it, what else does a so-called correction officer, they never, never corrected a soul. I was in uh, prison for longer than this country was in World War II. I was in nine different prisons from one coast of the United States to another. I never saw you correct a soul. Why do you call yourself a corrections officer when that, that's fraudulent advertising? You're a guard. Your job is to try to keep people in there, right? Well, sir, it is not our job to correct the individual. That's up to the individual. Well, why do you, why do you call yourself a corrections officer then? Because that's not the business you're in. You're simply in there to make sure that you have the same number and identity of warm bodies at the end of your shift as you do at the beginning of your shift, right? Sir, that is part of a corrections officer's job. What else? Well, and also it was, um, 
or also was uh, reporting me that you said, uh... Well, what else is part of your job? What else do you do? What do we do? Yeah, I mean, besides what we just talked about. Well, we ensure the security and the, uh, and the, uh, confinement of the residents. Also, we provide... You mean the prisoners? Yes. Right. But well, why don't you call them what they are? They're prisoners. Convicts, right? All right. Well, I was trying to be diplomatic about this. Well, why be prisoners. diplomatic about it? I'm not diplomatic about what you do. You're a guard, and I was a prisoner and a convict. Well, right. And that's what the rest of them are. Corrections officer. Why? Because that is the title of my job. Guard is an archaic offensive term. It's not an offensive term. It's an accurate term. Sir, the it trouble is, is the term. trouble is, you're ashamed of the fact that you're a guard, and oh, so no, you're trying to change. You're trying to, you're trying to change it by calling yourself something that you are not. You're a guard. I was a prisoner, a convict. I don't have any problem with saying I was a prisoner and a convict. Why do you have prison a problem admitting that you're a guard? I do not have a problem admitting I'm a guard. However, my title is a corrections officer. Fine. The issue is not with the word guard. You, you do understand that if you call a dog a horse, if 10,000 people call a dog a horse, <laughs> it's still not a horse. It's yes, still a dog. The problem is not with the term guard. Okay. It's, it's a problem with this because... What is reported that you said here is because that's all they can do. That's what we are is because that's all we can do. Yeah. Uh, so now, that is, an, that is an asinine statement, sir. Well, tell me why. Well, we have some very highly trained, head, highly educated people working for the department. Many of them degreed. We have former police officers working for the department. We have veterans. We have all walks of life working for the department. Which department are we talking about? Department of Corrections of Michigan. Well, I've never been in the Department of Corrections in Michigan. I have been in the entire uh, federal system. I've also been in the uh, local system in California. Uh, I was briefly in New Jersey and also in the District of Columbia. Now, tell me about these degrees that these fellows have. What are their degrees in? Well, that's, that's with the individual. I'm not saying all officers are degreed. I'm just saying that... Or, or the ones who are, what are their degrees? You'd have to speak to them, sir. I don't know. I, I just see. work with several individuals who I know for a fact are degreed in education and what have you. Oh, I see. Mm-hmm. And, as far, and I guess you went on to say uh, that we are all half illiterate and stupid. The, uh, the general uh, run of guard that I found in nine different prisons over a period of uh, about five years, uh, approximately 50% were functionally illiterate. By that I mean it took them uh, anywhere from a minute to six or seven minutes to uh, make out what we call a shot, that is a, a charge slip or to sign their name. Okay. Matter of fact, in one of the places I was, the guys, they, they, you know, they had to do count. Had to have a prisoner go around and do the count for them. They couldn't count that high. Well, sir, I cannot speak... What do you think of guards when you walk up to them and tell them to turn in their radio because it's receiving, receiving too slowly? They go to turn in their radio. <laughs> well, they have the, the sharpest knife in the drawer. Mm. However, sir, I can't speak for the federal system. I can only speak for the uh, department which I'm employed by, which is Michigan. Mm -hmm. And... The officers within our department, we're all, um, we're all at minimum high school graduates. We all have to have college education. Uh, what, t tell me, well, well, are you college educated? Yes, sir, I am. Where'd you go to college? What'd you study? I studied criminal justice at Lansing Community College. Uh -huh. Okay. No, I'm sir. not saying I'm degreed, but yes, I have attended college. Okay. And as far as uh, once we have in-service training in education, due to Public Act 415 here in Michigan, mm -hmm. I mean, we are... I, to the best of my knowledge, we are the most extensively trained officers in the country. You mean the most extensively trained prison guards, not police officers? Corrections officers. Yeah, guards. Well, we're going to go round and round about that one, so. No, sir, but I just, you know, find I don't think that it's very fair of you to be categorizing every officer or every state's correctional system on your experience. Well, my experience has been sufficiently broad for me, uh, you know, taking a sampling as I said, of prison guards in uh, federal system, local systems in a number of states over a period of five years, and uh, I'm very comfortable with uh, calling prison guards prison guards, and just the f mere fact that you won't even admit you're a prison guard, uh, I, I think speaks like well of my assessment. Sir. Like I said earlier, sir, my problem is not with your definition of an officer or guard or what have you. My problem is with your view of us in general. Well, my view of you in general is, uh, is as it is and based on five years' experience in nine different prisons, state and federal. It, ha it does not include your uh, particular prison or, or a system. I will certainly acknowledge that. However, I rather doubt 
that your system is uh, so outstanding as to raise it materially above the national average? Well, sir, I beg to differ. But once again, I have no experience with any other correctional institution myself. There are no I correctional think. institutions. There are, however, quite a few prisons. Prisons? You know, we're just getting here into definitions. However, um... Well, why do you call it a correctional institution? Because that's what they're referred to here in Michigan. Yeah, but it isn't what it does, though, is it? It's a prison. It's a correctional institution. What happens? It's you? a prison. Sure. I mean, we're splitting hairs here over terms. No, we're not splitting hairs here. We're using the English language. You're supposed to be an educated man. You've got some college behind you. You don't seem to be able to speak the English language correctly, though. Well, when it is labeled and referred to as a correctional institution, that is what it's called. Again, I tell you, sir, that if you call a dog a horse, <laughs> you don't turn it into a horse. Well, I'll tell you what, we're obviously not going to get very far, but I do appreciate uh, your calling in and letting us have your sentiments. We have to One more. go to some what is known as commercials. and There's no other uh, euphemism for them. They're dreadful, but we have to go to them. May I make one closing comment? Sure. Okay, you made, I was also reported to me that you made the statement that we are all corrupt. No, I said, that, I said that all the prisons are corrupt. There isn't a prison in this country, so far as I know of, and I've been in a lot of them, that wasn't actually run by the prisoners. And in every prison I was in, I said I was in nine different prisons, I could have whatever I want. Now, uh, the way we got stuff in was through corrupted guards. Okay, well, I honestly hope, sir, that you're not making the, uh, you're not assuming that all guards are corrupt. No, definitely not, not all guards Thank are not you. corrupt, not all of them. However, in every prison, there are sufficient corrupt guards so that the prisoners effectively can run the prison. They run the prison through the corrupted guards. I could have had any woman that I wanted, I mean, in terms of blonde, blue, uh, brunette, redhead, uh, you, you know, just you, you make your order. You, I could have had any drug that I was uh, prepared to be able to pay for. I'd be killed if I didn't pay. Uh, name my brand of liquor, any kind of contraband like that that I wanted. And believe me, it came in through corrupted guards. Well, I will not doubt that. You know, I'm not saying that that is true with any and all systems, but I can see that happening. Of course you can. You've been there long, long enough to know I'm right. Well, I've never been witness to it, but yeah. I, well, I know, yeah. The, you know, nobody's ever sees anything. Oh, come on, Mr. Liddy. Now, that's going too far. Now, you you never see anything, right? I've never seen anything of that. Before. There you go. I'm sure you never have. Well, Mr. But, Mr. You, but you know I'm right about the corruption, don't you? Excuse me? You know I'm right about the corruption, right? I know it exists, but you're... Yeah. I'm... But you've never seen it. Yes, I've never seen it. I, I agree with you. Yeah. And, and by all means, stick to that, because otherwise you're going to have a real problem, uh, you know, with the union and all that stuff. Uh, no, sir, because like I said, I've never been witness to that. Yeah, okay. Quite frankly, I'm offended that you're even suggesting that I have. That you've been, uh, I'm, You're offended that I would be uh, suggest that you might have been witness to something like that? How long have you been in the system? Six years, sir. Oh, come on. Six I've years, never been witness to anything like that. Okay. All right. You've never been witness to it. That's well, I'm fine. a party to it, and I don't think if there's one officer out there that will say that I have been. Fine. I'm, I'm sure that there isn't an officer out there that will say he's been a witness to it either. Well, Mr. Lee, we're obviously of two different viewpoints. We obviously are, sir. And I respect your viewpoint, and I just wish you could respect mine. Um, I, I can't respect a viewpoint that refuses to call something even by its proper name. That's the problem. I mean, well, you know, when you, when, you, when you will not call a prison a prison, when you will not call a guard a guard, but employ euphemisms to try to pretty it up, uh, th you know, that does not engender respect. So how long ago were you incarcerated? I got out in uh, September of 1977. Well, sir, a lot of things can change in almost 20 years. Uh, yeah, but the nature of man and the nature of prison guards and the nature of prisoners doesn't change. <laughs> well, I beg to differ. Okay, we, well... We differ. We'll, we'll agree to disagree, sir. Sounds good to me, sir. All right. Thank you very much. You bet. Crass commercial messages coming up. We'll be right back. We can't sugarcoat that. The G. Gordon Liddy Show. Radio Free D.C. Anyway, the uh, reason I'm calling, among other things to speak of, is the uh, notions about AIDS and AZT. Um, I'm a skeptic, and I've got lots of um, degrees and all that in math and science-related topics, and I was hunting in the library for a a book like UFOs or something to pick on, and I ran across John Lauritsen's book, Poisoned by Prescription and the AIDS War, and I thought these would be 
easy to take apart and dismantle as logical arguments because I knew what everybody else knows about AIDS. And in fact, I was impressed by the way that he uh, um, documents his researches and documents what he's been finding out about it. His background is in uh, statistical analysis of scientific... What is, his, what is his conclusion about AZT and AIDS? His conclusion, he has a, has a number, there's a, there's a number of conclusions, and the basic upshot is that, at, at the very least, we don't know what causes AIDS. Mm -hmm. And also, HIV has, is not shown to cause AIDS. Mm -hmm. And more, most importantly, <clears throat> AZT, which has been around for many years, um, is a deadly poison. It was originally designed to be a, 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 um, uh, what is it, a chemotherapy treatment, mm -hmm. but was deemed by the FDA to be so severe and basically didn't do much to cancer that um, they decided that they couldn't allow it to be used. Wow. And so the, uh, the notion is, which is where you get the notion for what would make a nice movie script, is that here you got this deadly drug, which isn't anything, any good for anything, so what you do is you start a PR campaign that says AZT will cure AIDS, and the very panicked people who have it... Um, well, we know it doesn't, it doesn't kill AIDS. Uh, well, no, cure AIDS. originally they came out and said the study showed that it, uh, you know, it, it, it improved people's lives who had AIDS. Well, sir, unfortunately, we, we, we have unfortunately run out of time, but I... I get him as a guest. All right, good idea. Thank you. Westwood One Radio Networks. And Bench hits okay. the deep left. That might be. It's the two appeals, and ultimately it will be appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States, which may or may not accept the, the appeal. But this isn't the, uh, the end of it by any means. But I suspect that if it, if it is upheld, that there will be that phenomenon that you suggest. Yes, indeed. So basically you're saying that each state will eventually have to adopt their own Proposition 187. Yes, uh, in that particular area, and certainly in in uh, Florida and, and and certainly other other states, I I don't know that um, that in Idaho, for example, that they they have much of a problem like that. It, it is essentially geographical. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome, Dennis. Thank you, sir. All right, we're moving along now uh, to Rochester, New York, and Ed. Ed, you're on the G. Gordon Liddy Show. Good morning, Sensei. Oh, good morning, Ed. <laughs> I wanted to. Let, I know we don't have much time, but I want to let you know how much uh, myself and many other people in the Rochester metro area appreciate your show. Uh, after listening to your show and reading your books, you've inspired me to do many things that I that I always wanted to do. Like I'm, I'm a very voracious reader now, and I've taken up uh, uh, the martial arts, and I've got a wonderful instructor, and uh, I I know from reading your books that and your first caller of the day that, uh, you know, that you're knowledgeable on that. And I just wanted to basically let you know how much I appreciate that, and perhaps, you know, the folks out here in Rochester, maybe we should have a host appreciation day where they, uh, you know, let the powers that be know that we enjoy the show and get a few friends together and drag them over there and make them listen to the show and get them interested. Well, thank you.